Uh, uh, Sonny, yes, uh, very happy you came down, man. Yeah, great to be here. It was uh, We met, uh, was it in June or July? That would have been in June. June, yeah. So yes. We met uh, while I did a project uh, with uh, the company I work for, CSP. Uh, we went to go shoot uh, a yacht called Snowbird that was for sale. Yeah. And has it been bought since we... Uh, were there? Not yet, but uh, they have some. They have some interest. Apparently, some people okay. have been around looking at it. Because cool, you mentioned the owner yesterday, so I wasn't sure if it was the new owner or if it was the the same owner that that has it currently listed. Same guy, poor guy. He's a uh, he's not poor, obviously, but he's trying to get rid of that boat, <laughs> and it just keeps costing him money. Yeah, so that's something I really wanted to get, you know, get more familiarized with. Um, I've been around boats my whole life, so I grew up in Haiti. Uh, my grandfather had a boat, and a lot of people in Haiti have boats. A lot of nice boats over there, and um, had the pleasure of being in, in quite a few interesting boats. But never a yacht like the one we're on that we shot on. Um, what is what is something that you have to consider when you get a yacht? Like, in terms of like storing it, obviously you can't park these things at your house unless you have a mansion. Yeah. So what are some of the things you have to go through when, when you have a boat like this and you have to maintain it, on, on a, I'm assuming, on a port? Well, the bigger marinas like that, they, they charge by the foot, and uh, it used to be only a couple of dollars a foot. Now I've heard some places are as high as $7 a foot. You mean a foot, like, so if a boat is 100 feet long? $700. Just to park the boat there? Wow. Usually by the day, too. W wow, wow, okay, interesting. By the day, wow. Okay, so do the, the, does the port manager supply the boat with the captain and the crew, or is that something that the owner has to do? Yeah, the, the hiring of the owner is usually done, uh, or the captain is usually hired through the owner. Um, and in some cases, uh, there's management companies and do hiring and, and placement for captains. But typically, especially if you have a more involved owner, they, they will interview and hire the captain themselves. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Now we're getting to boat, but first, let, let, let's backtrack a bit. Let's get to the to you a little uh, to get to know you a bit and how long you've been boating so if you don't mind I know we kind of jumped ahead here but if you don't mind introducing yourself like your name your last name I actually don't even know your last name so I'm about to learn it for the first time but and, and where you're from originally are you from down here or are you from up north yeah my name is Sonny Sonny Parker and I was actually born in Key West okay. so a little ways down the road from here and uh, I grew up pretty much in the Orlando area and I went to school up there, and I've been working on boats since uh, 2010. Okay. And by boats, you mean like yachts or just any kind of boats? I've been in yachting since 2017. Okay. So what's the difference between yachting and, and a regular boat? Well, <laughs> size, <laughs> size for the one, the and size. the budget. <laughs> How do you transition from one to the other? Do you have to go to a – is there a – boating school that you kind of have to go and learn the etiquettes of how to be on a proper boat or something? Or? Sure. There's all sorts of uh, different training programs and even uh, maritime colleges where people go through and start just like a regular four-year college and they come out with their merchant mariners documents and all their credentials ready to go into the industry. Okay. Uh, but typically those people go on the commercial side. Uh, the jobs usually pay way better uh, and and usually have better benefits too but it's uh it's just a different side you know people are attracted to the yachting thing because it's fun you know there's there's a good camaraderie there's usually lots of good parties it's been a little different for me because i got into it when i was already an adult and okay. <laughs> it wasn't 20 when i got into this right so in, tw in 2010 um when you first got into boating what got you into it like well, why did you get into boating or what were you doing before you, you started boating? Did you have a career or something? Yeah, I was actually studying biology in school. Marine biology or? Uh, just bi general, general biology, biology. at uh, UCF in Orlando there. So I kind of got over all my little entry-level jobs and stuff, and I took a job down in the Keys uh, as an animal trainer, uh, working at a dolphin facility, and that's near Marathon. Dolphin facility, interesting. Yeah. So they had they had like wild dolphin that they caught, they put there, or they're like already captive. Those are dolphins that uh, they they raise there, so they have like a breeding program. Mm. 
um, and they're associated with like Miami Seaquarium and a lot of the other ones. But uh, that was the job that brought me back down to the Keys, and I was, I don't know, 26, 27, something like that. Okay. And this is 2010, right? Yeah. Okay. 2009, I think that was. Okay. So I didn't stay at that job very long. I I started oh, wait, demos or something. Um, a little bit, but mostly it was just because uh, I started dating one of the other trainers, and it was like a huge <laughs> mess. And I was like, I got to get out of here. You hey, don't date your coworkers, right? <laughs> yeah, I I fell for that. Well, at least you're not fucking the boss, so you're fine. <laughs> that could probably would have worked out better, except she wasn't. She didn't look good. <laughs> the boss. Yeah, Boston. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was uh down there at that point and I, I've been pretty lucky because we have family ties in Key West obviously and I always wanted to try uh, my hand at being a lobster fisherman and in the Keys in Key West in particular they call them crawfish. And oh wow you know I thought they were different things I didn't they're the same? So no they they are different species. Oh, okay. Just making sure okay because I, I could have swore there's a, there's if I'm not mistaken, there's lobster, there's crawfish, and I think, well, I don't know what it's called in, there's another one. I, in, in Creole, I know there's there's one called langus, and there's one called, yeah. and there's one called omar, and they're not the same. And when I was younger, I used to think they were the same, but they're two different types of lobsters, but I don't know what the English translations are. There. I didn't know if it, it could be crawfish. Crawfish could be the translation for one of them, I'm not really sure. Probably the langus. So that's what it's called even in English? It's called a langoose? It's not lobster? No, they call them spiny lobster. But, okay. but uh, in Key West in particular, crawfish is an old term that carries over from the Bahamian settlers that came over in the early to mid-1800s. They settled there, and they were English. And they, you know, they also had roots in New England. And up there, they differentiate between the lobster with claws, the, the American lobster, and then the spiny lobster, they called those crawfish. Because mm, they don't have claws? No, they don't have claws. They have the whips, the long whips. Gotcha. Oh, by the way, cheers, my mate. Thanks for bringing some of the brewskis. Of Are you a fan of Modelo? Is that why you chose Modelo? It's the best. It's the best? It's the best. Really? I, I actually got into drinking Modelo when I was down in Key West. Okay. Working on those uh, trap boats. Is there a reason why it's Modelo and not like Bud Light or any other American beer? It's just nice, refreshing beer. Okay, nice. All right, okay. I mean, it's good. I, I prefer it over Corona if we're talking Mexican beers. Yeah, so sure. definitely prefer Modelo. Um, okay, cool. So after the whole uh, marine biologist, uh, sorry, the, do the dolphin experience, you go to lobster fishing. Um, whose boat are you on? Did you have to apply for that gig? Did you know somebody I just went down to the docks and uh, asked around and there was an old timer down there so my grandfather he moved my my mom's family moved to the Keys and Key West in the 60s okay. in the early 60s and he was a technician for IBM down there he worked on the Navy base and everything and, and other places around town and mostly for the Navy but he did lobster fishing in his spare time on the weekends and eventually he had a a wooden lobster boat built uh, by a local boat builder an old Cuban man named Petey Roach he lived right across the street he yeah he lived like right across the way from my grandfather but he wouldn't build him a boat right away until he asked around and he got to know my grandfather's character gotcha so he's one of those people where it's like he needs a connection in order to build the the yeah. proper boat, I guess, for that person. Yeah, especially because, you know, Key West was a, a tight community, especially in the 60s, and, you know, my grandfather was an out-of-towner. Out of town from where? Uh, originally North Dakota, uh, but he lived in Miami for a few years. That's where my, my mom was born in Miami. A okay. um, couple of my other aunts and uncles, I, I believe, were all. Your father, also from Miami? He, he was originally born in uh, Virginia, actually. Okay. But his family also came to Key West with the Navy uh, in the same time period, in the 60s. Okay. Interesting. And um, did you have any prior 
experience to lobster fishing before you got this job? No, no, none whatsoever. So you didn't do the school route. You basically went in as a fresh person and you learned everything on the, like, practically. Yeah, it's a pretty rough and tumble industry. Uh, I just went around and asked around and they didn't know who I was, you know, and I got on a boat with an old timer down there. And the first season I spent the whole time picking the traps and cleaning them and, you know, you got to have a, a good work ethic and everything you do. So I uh, I got through that season with them. And then the next season, I was the, the mate. So I worked the winch. And that's considerably, people think that's less work, but it's a lot more work because when you get the trap, you got to haul the rope in and you got to put the rope up on a snatch block. Mm -hmm. And then you put it down on a hydraulic winch. And then that's that, what you're, you're operating. Yes. And that brings the trap to the gunnel. But once you get it to the gunnel, you got to stop it, grab it at the at the grip right next to the uh, base of the trap, and then you reverse the winch and yank it up on the gunnel. That's all you doing it? Yeah. Okay, gotcha. So the winch will get it to the boat, but you still have to get it up on the gunnel. Okay. And, and how heavy is these things typically? Um, they can weigh 150, 160 pounds when they're wet. You're not doing this by yourself, I'm assuming. You have other people, other crew helping the, you. There's a second guy on deck. Gotcha. No, when you pull it on the deck, you do it by yourself. That whole hundred pounds yeah. with with the crawfish or lobster inside. So it'll be like right here in front of you. Uh -huh. And then you when you reverse the winch, it takes the tension off. Oh, so then gotcha. you then you're able to pull it towards you. I understand. Okay. I but understand. it's still a tremendous workout. I, I mean, it's like sure it is. <laughs> and we pulled 300 to 350 traps a day on that boat. 350 traps a day. So are these traps owned by the boat? Yes. Uh, every commercial fisherman is uh, licensed for a certain amount of traps, and they pay every year to keep those in continuity. They they have a permit that they buy every year. It's a, a tag, basically. Gotcha. But they own the rights to that many traps, and that's that's okay. what their whole business is. The locations, do they own that spot? Can another person come and be like, hey, I'm taking this spot today? No, um... There's no, yeah, there's no uh, bottom rights or anything. Okay. But, you know, certain people fish in uh, areas traditionally, and, you know, they kind of respect each other's um, certain turf yeah, when I it comes you. to that. But, but not always. And that's always a big argument in all kinds of fishing is people. Yeah, getting on my turf, like, yo, this is my, this has been seeding my family for years. Like, you're not taking my, my, cra my lobster spot. Yeah. So what's a season? You mentioned a season. What, what, how long is a season? So it's open for eight months, basically, uh, from the beginning of August until the end of March. Mm -hmm. And that has to do with overfishing and mating and not... Yeah, the summer season is closed because that's when they breed. Gotcha. Gotcha. And are, 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 is there a limit to how much lobsters you can fish during the season? Commercially, no, there's no limit. Uh, okay. what, what you catch is what you catch. Uh, on the recreational side, you're allowed six lobster per person per day. And that's, that's people just going out in their boats, diving. And uh, actually up here, once you get out of Monroe County, I think they're allowed to have 12 per person per day. How deep is the water that these cages are in? You typically, you know, the water in the Keys is shallow until you go outside of the reef track. So you're looking at anywhere from 70 to 80 feet on the deep side. And when you go up towards the bay side of the Keys, which is everything on the northern side of the, of the lower Keys, okay. you're talking still maybe 50, 60 feet at the deepest, but typically 30 feet, 40 feet. And then there's people that fish all the way up in the shallows too. Their traps might be in 12 feet of water. Okay. And the deeper the better or it doesn't work that way it just depends on your strategy really they they move around a lot and they have you know just like everything else they have their own you know kind of circadian rhythm they're active at night is when they come out to feed and so at night they come out on the flats and in the turtle grass and everything and they forage and then when the day is coming they hide back in a rock or another natural ledge or something, and then they find your trap, they're like, oh, it smells good. It has 
bait in there. They want to go inside and hide. And you just get stuck in there, or does a trap door close, or how does it work? They can actually leave. Uh, they did studies way back, like in the 90s, way, way back. <laughs> like, yeah, now it's like 30 years ago. <laughs> yeah, they did some monitoring studies where they had uh, some kind of trigger or something on the door, and they could they could come, they can get in and out. You know, they're they're pretty agile. Okay, interesting. And um, how long did you do that for? I did the lobster traps for about six years. It was five seasons. Okay. All with the same crew? No, I didn't. I only worked for the old timer, uh, old Billy there, Captain Billy. I only worked with him for a season and a half. Um, okay. And then I got out and I actually worked with another man who is a family friend. He grew up down the street from my mom and my uncle uh, on Washington Street in Key West. Okay, cool. So what's interesting is is um, the crew. Like, how much people do you have on a crew with you? Like, when you're when you're lobster fishing, is it the captain, you, who's operating the ranch, and someone cleaning it? Yeah, yeah. Typically three guys. Some of the bigger boats will have uh, three guys on deck and the captain himself. But it's uh, it's pretty typical to only have the captain and the mate, and then you'll have a deckhand. Okay, so you said you used to do 350 cages a day? Yeah. Wow, how long does it take for you to do 350? It's all day. All we're, day. we're out when the sun's coming up. We're, we're already got the first couple traps on the boat, clean the lobsters, put the new bait in, and they're overboard. How often are you a, is there a dud cage, like nothing inside? That, um, I won't say it's random, but sometimes they fall in bad bottom you know if there's spots where there's like a silty bottom or something like that they don't go in those areas what does that mean, silty bottom? so silty where it's fine mud or something like that or or like mucky sand oh, sometimes okay. you get in a little hole or something down there where your trap settles in a bad place and they just won't go in gotcha. um, sometimes you get a big like a mutton snapper or something goes in the trap after a lobster and they'll eat the lobster inside wait what'd you call that thing a uh, mutton snapper. What is that? Another. Uh, it's a big, big fish. Um, oh, it's a fish. Yeah, it's a big snapper. They oh, call them. Oh, it's an actual. Okay, so it's like the snapper, like we get at stores. <laughs> call them. Uh, the Cuban name for him is uh, Pargo. Pargo. Interesting. Okay, so you left Billy. You're with the new crew now. Yeah. And uh, are you still pulling 350 a day? Yeah, or more. Or more. Okay. And how does how does the lobster boat the team? make their money? Is it based on how much lobster you bring in at the end of the day? Or are you getting a salary? Yeah, when I was when I was first started with uh, Billy there, I was just getting a day day pay and day it, pay. it wasn't it wasn't much. And I was lucky to be able to get in with the next guy, uh, Jeffrey. And he was he was a lot more traditional. So on his boat, we would work for a share of the catch. Oh. And that was usually 25 to 30% of the profit that we made after we paid for the expenses of the trip. Okay. And can you give me a, a rough estimate of how much you can pull in on a day's work? Well, it took us five days, sometimes four days. In the summer, you have longer hours, daylight. So we could do all the traps in four days. And we fished around 1200 traps with Jeffrey. So four or five days of, uh, you know, actual work out pulling the gear. And you have a day on each end to get the boat ready. So you say you've got a week invested in, in your whole pull around cycle. And gosh, back then on a couple of good pull arounds, uh, we did really good and we we're getting six to eight thousand dollars in some of those checks but other times you know you don't catch really good you might only catch we had uh, one season in particular was pretty bad for us uh, we didn't we didn't just catch much in our in our zone you know where we were fishing on that bottom they just didn't come that way all the all the lobster were inshore that year okay do you guys have a cook on board even no. on those no so how do you guys 
not really. <laughs> Usually everyone's tired of them by then. But uh, we we had a little a little stove on one side of the boat, and we ate pretty good. You know, we'd always have like steak and maybe do a put ribs in the oven. <laughs> have a nice salad, and uh, you know get get a loaf of bread out, buttered buttered Cuban bread. All right, well, what's the craziest thing that's happened to you on a lobster boat? What's the wildest thing that's ever happened? Nothing crazy? Nothing? You weren't caught in a storm or something? I mean, we saw plenty of rough weather out there, but, uh, you're, you know, you, you can anticipate what's coming. It's not like we go out just at random, like, we're going hell or ha high water, you know? We, <laughs> we always kind of knew what we were getting into. In the wintertime, it's, it's usually always rough when you go out because you got to time it between the cold fronts. And they actually move around and are active when the cold fronts come and stir the water up, they move from place to place. They're migrating. So that's when you catch really good. And so we'd go out on, on some rough days, you know, 20 knots is like nothing to be out there pulling traps. It's, it's rough and it's sporty and you get sprayed and splashed, but. Any crazy creatures? What's the biggest animal you saw while you're out there? Oh, uh, sometimes you get big uh, moray eels, big green moray eels will get in the trap. And when that trap comes up, you just carefully open the door. They have a little trap door on top. You let them out. And you put the trap back in the water and let them swim away. Yeah, how big do those things get? Oh, they can get like six feet long. They're, and they're very dangerous. Wow. As they, they can come out. They have, you know, four rows of teeth, and they all point backwards. So if they get a hold of you, forget it. Wow. It actually happened on my uncle's boat one time. He, he had a guy, a, an eel came out on the deck, and he told the guy not to mess with it. And the guy went over there, tried to wrangle with it and throw it by the tail or something, and it grabbed his forearm. And then the guy started whipping around, and yeah. it, it shredded his forearm. And the guy almost bled to death. He had to be air vacked out. So, okay, interesting. So how does that happen? So an emergency happens, you radio it in. How long does it take for response that you typically get to you? Well, I don't know. That's a that's a helicopter response. So you figure they've got a few minutes to get their crew out unless the helicopter's already on station somewhere. And then they have to get to the location. They got to drop a basket and a medic, hoist them back up, it's you know. Like yeah. yeah. That that was a pretty lucky pretty lucky guy. Wow. Uh he just wasn't very smart. So <laughs> when you when you're getting on this boat for the first time and you've never done the job, What's some of the first things they make you do to get you acquainted with what the job you're about to do? Oh, well, when you come in as like the first guy, you got to you got to bait the traps and they use salted cow hides for bait on pretty much every lobster boat down in, in the Keys. And it's kind of like half spoiled, you know, it stinks. Sometimes it has like maggots in it. Oh my so gosh, yummy. Yeah, so that's a that's a nasty thing that you always got to work with. You know, there's always some hurdle to overcome in the beginning of every every new job. Yeah. And uh I was used to kind of off key stuff like that. So I was like this is not really that bad. So what would you do on your off season? In the off season when I was working with Jeffrey because I was a a you know, a full share crew member you spend time in the summer repairing all the all the gear, all the traps. Okay. So the traps that are only a year or two old, you take those out and you repair them, and you put fresh boards where they need it. You put extra staples. You put the new permit tag on. Sometimes you replace the lines and the floats. Okay. Um, everybody has their own colors that they use to designate their traps so the float color is unique to each fisherman and you paint those you get them all fresh and ready to go for the next season okay. so you've usually got four to six weeks of work to go into the trap yard every day and get your gear all prepped for the next season gotcha. and uh, then you have the rest of the summer to do whatever you want okay <laughs> all right and um when 
when you're doing all the routine maintenance and stuff like that, I'm assuming you're you're learning this stuff on the fly, right? Like you're you're just out of using it so much, you're getting familiarized with the equipment. Yeah, it's pretty basic stuff. Yeah. Uh, I I grew up doing like carpentry work with my dad and stuff, so it's like second nature. Okay. How long and when when you got into it, were you enjoying it? Like, is it something you enjoyed a lot that made you want to keep doing it? Yeah, actually, I, I loved it. Um, my favorite part about it, I think, was that you you live your life at a natural rhythm. You don't get up every day at 8 o'clock and get ready and get out the door. Sit, you got to go in traffic. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. And then at 5 o'clock, you, you stamp the card, and then you go home. And you get more traffic. Yeah, more traffic. So <laughs> I really enjoyed kind of living around that natural cycle because our lives revolved around the life cycle of the crawfish gotcha. and their life revolves around the moon the tides the cold fronts yeah, they're very much it's with nature. yeah it's seasonal so i i like that um you know i was i knew what the moon cycle was coming up for months okay how did you guys track that you guys had an app back then or I don't, we didn't even have smartphones back yeah, then. No smartphones yeah, it was like 2012. So you had like a, a map or something? Yeah, I would just print out a moon chart for the year. Gotcha. And, uh, you know, you just, it's good to kind of pay attention to that kind of stuff when you work on the water anyway. But I, uh, I had fun doing that. In the off season, uh, you know, living in the Keys, there's plenty of other fun opportunities i played in a uh, couple bands down there in the off season in the summer uh what did you play uh i'm a drummer oh nice yeah hence why you gravitated towards the drum set over there okay nice i respect drummers man that's th i feel like that's a tough gig like the whole band is already on your beat you you definitely have to pay attention yeah um you know listening is a big part of any musician but as a drummer, you really got to look around and see what other people are doing. You kind of feel where the where the meter of the song is going next, you know, and you got to respond to people. If you yeah. see that guy, he, he's ready to take a solo, then you just might carry out another 16 bars and let him do a nice long solo and then come back into the into the regular part of the cool. song. And did you learn did you learn um, drumming while you were in the keys or is this something you've been doing since you were a kid? Yeah, uh, my dad's a drummer, uh, so my older cousin and my brother and I, we all learned how to play drums. Okay. Was he part of a band, too? Yeah, he used to play back in the day, back in Key West and no, stuff. Oh, okay, I was going to say no famous band or something. Yeah, like nothing that. big <laughs> like that. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you did the, the lobster thing for about five years, and then you decided you needed an upgrade? Um, we moved out of the Keys when our daughter was on the way. Before our daughter was born, so um, we went up back up to Central Florida, and she we followed her job at that point, mm -hmm. and so we got a nice little house up there in a pretty rural spot in Central Florida, and it was nice. We were there for a few years while our daughter was young, and uh, that's when I got into the whole yachting side of it. Okay, so how did you transition over to the yachting side? Did you have to lo go into some type of course to learn the etiquettes, or is it a network thing? The more people you know, the easier it is for you to get the job. Networking is a huge part of the yachting industry. I think it's probably, I don't want to say a number, but a, a large portion of people get their next job from someone that they know who calls them up and says, hey, we need, we need a mate, we need a deckhand, we need three more stewardesses. Like, and everyone, like, everyone knows everybody's pretty well connected. So It's like that in the film industry, too. It's, it's a lot of networking. Yeah. yeah, That's how you get the same crew work on multiple projects together. Right. It's the same thing, yeah. And it, just like you mentioned, the camaraderie, it's, it's really fun when you're part of that yeah. crew. It just feels like... It's there's just some there's a joy to just working in unison with other people and you're all in the same, you know, mindset. You guys know the same agenda, same goal. It's just a really, really interesting, really fun environment to work that way. Yeah. You know, and I noticed that when you when we were on the boat um, on the yacht, I noticed that you guys were like almost like a family. You know, that and it was super interesting to see that kind of like camaraderie, like you mentioned, 
Um, and that's why I was wondering, like, when we were on there and we, I met the captain, it was really interesting. Like, I didn't realize the captain's role on the boat is pretty much like a manager where he hires, he picks his crew that he knows that's going to be able to do the job based on the qualifications needed to uphold, like, a yacht versus, like, a regular 40-foot or something, yeah. you know? And, it, and I thought it was super interesting to see how – and. What was the name of the gentleman? Um, what comes after the, 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 the captain? What's the next tier down? Oh, that's the mate. The first mate. The first mate. So the other gentleman that we met, the one that actually went to school, right? Yes, that's Josh. Yeah. So he's like the second person in charge if captain's not there, right? That's it. Okay. So can you get into a position like that straight out of school or do you need experience? Do you, do you have to go through the ropes like how kind of like what you did, work your way up? Or can you just be like, hey, I'm fresh out of school. I know all the shit I need to know. Let's put me first mate. They, they usually have a, an entry level position even in the commercial world uh, because there'll be, there'll be other more senior people on the boat. They already hold that first mate, second mate, third officer. They, they have much, many more positions in the administrative side on the big commercial boats. Gotcha. But, uh, but on yachts, some of the big boats that are, you know, 40, 50 meters, they might have a couple officers under the captain uh, and then a deck team with a, with a bosun in charge of the deck team. And they, they are more compartmentalized on the larger boats like that. Okay. And usually when you get above 40 or 50 meters, I mean, there's there's 90 meter boats out there. I don't know how many there are these days, but there's quite a few. Yeah. I mean, just when I went to that yard, the boats that are on that yard, man, my gosh, it's there's probably billions of dollars worth of boats just chilling there. Easily. Jeez, that's just <laughs> crazy <laughs> to see that. I mean, it's still mind blowing. I've, I had never been on a yacht before, but when that door opened and I saw the living room. I was like, bro, this is nicer than most apartments I've ever been to. It's, it's high class. It's, it's fantastic. It's, it's pretty crazy. So on these boats, like, like the boat you're on now, the crew has its own deck, right? Yeah, we have, a, we have a crew section that's up forward, and that's where it is on most of the boats. Some of the boats actually have a, a crew area that's all the way aft at the, at the rear part of the ship. Uh, but... Pretty much all the ones I've been on, it's always up in the forward part of the ship. Okay. So how did you get into the, the, the yachting that you got into? Did you, did you go through the schooling or did you network? Uh, I got pretty lucky again, actually. Uh, another family friend okay. who, he grew up down the street from my mom and my uncle as well. In the Keys. Uh, yeah, in Key West. So he grew up a block this way, and the man I worked with on the lobster boat, he grew up a block the other direction. And uh, that's Jamie, Captain Jamie, that you met on Snowbird. Oh, so that's how far back you know him. Yeah, him and my uncle have been friends since they were, like, little kids. Oh, interesting. Okay, cool. And uh, Jamie actually lived in the Keys when I was down there. So we had a few fun projects that we did together, and we used to hang out all the time. And when he knew that I was back up in Central Florida, he's like, well, I got a big boat that I'm working on why don't you come over and try doing some some yacht stuff okay. so that was the uh, buck passer that was 2017 it was a beautiful all aluminum real classic looking uh, motor yacht okay how big was that yacht 120 meters yeah. no 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 feet, <laughs> feet. Oh, no, yeah I'm in America I don't I'm not very good with my meters <laughs> <laughs> yes uh 120 footer okay so the one you're on now for context how big is the one you're on now uh, 128. Also, oh, it wasn't. Oh, so it's not that much. Yeah, not it looks way bigger in person. It's a very spacious boat. It's beamy, which it refers to the width of it, and it has a lot of internal volume. Okay, interesting. Which is uh, what they refer to as gross tonnage. It's a measurement, not actually of the weight of the vessel. It's the displacement. So it's more of measurement of the internal volume of the boat. Like how much it can hold, or type of thing. Like how much space. Oh, Okay. Okay. You know what? That's a, that's a, that's an interesting question. I never understood. How much weight can you put on a boat before it starts to like <laughs> start to go down? <laughs> it depends on how the weight is distributed. 
obviously. But let's say best case scenario, we're stacking things right in the middle. Well, if they're in the middle and, and down low, you keep your center of gravity down low. And you actually, you have a bunch of different calculations that they use to measure stability. Okay. Um, but the two probably most important ones, are your center of gravity and your center of buoyancy. So those change depending on how the boat is uh, laden. And then you can alter those. Like if a boat will capsize, if you have them very close to each other and it offsets, your center of buoyancy is underneath your center of gravity, the boat will roll over. So how does a, I remember a couple of years ago, I, I can't remember how, how far back, but you remember that cruise ship that capsized? Yeah, they hit the they hit the rock. Oh, they hit something that got them to capsize. How does how does something like that happen? Like I thought they have this ship mapped up by now. You know, the the captain was actually negligent in that case because he took it too close to the rocks, uh, like showing off basically oh, to like wow. bring everybody in for a, a big view. I guess there's like a a scenic point there, and those boats. They don't maneuver the same, you know. It, it takes a mile or two miles right, to, yeah. to get that boat to move the way you want it. That's something that was interesting that I found out when I used to be on boats in my grandfather's boat. When he'd let me drive, every time we had to turn, you know, he always told me, like, you, you can't turn it like, obviously, a car. So we would take these wide turns, yeah. and it's super interesting because the bigger the boat, obviously, the more radius you need to perform this, this maneuver. Yeah. Wow, that's super interesting. But, man, what... <laughs> what was he trying to show these people? That's crazy. I have no idea. That was really bad. He he actually left the boat after everything happened. He ran. He That's true. He did. And yeah, and the captain's not supposed to leave his ship. That's kind of like the undying, like, that's like an unwritten rule. Like, the captain has to go down with the ship. That and you're supposed to stay there and be in charge. You know where that originated from, by chance? Like, the, the like going down with the boat, the captain has to stay? I don't know. That's yeah. old maritime tradition Probably there. It goes way there. back. Probably back in the pirate times. Well, I mean, you you assume ultimate responsibility for right. not just the safety of the vessel, but more importantly, the people on board. Obviously, yeah. And and that's the weighty thing about about being a captain. So, yeah, there's a lot of like management and paperwork and rigmarole, but ultimately, it's it's the safety of the people on board that yeah. really matter especially when you're on a cruise ship that has like 2,000 people on there like that's that's ridiculous to take a chance like that and I don't even remember if there were casualties but I don't think there was but man how how irresponsible was this guy that was bad. yeah that was super bad okay so now you're on this boat your homeboy hooked you up uh what's your first job you're, you're at the bottom of the barrel here or are you washing the boat yeah same thing you come in washing the boat I was uh I did a lot of engine room work because Jamie actually he has a big time like unlimited engineer's license as well as his big cap so what does that mean engineering license you you can typically go two two different routes when you're coming into like a merchant mariner situation or, or any kind of offshore certification your engineering side deals with the propulsion plant of the boat and all of the systems that maintain, you know, the safety and running of the vessel. And then your deck department is the captain, the officers, and the deckhands. They're in charge of getting the boat safely from one place to the other, doing the navigation, berthing, maneuvering. That's the main role of the deck department. Okay. And you were part of the deck department? Yes, well, both actually, because um, okay. I got right in working with Jamie since he's an engineer and he knew that I was mechanically inclined. He put me in the engine room right away. I did a lot of uh, projects cleaning out the bilges. You know, the bilges in the engine room especially, they get full of all sorts of debris. They're not accessible all the time, so once you have all the deck plates up, you find all kinds of crap down there. So, What is the deck plate? Deck plate's just a, a metal plate that sits on top of the framework mm -hmm. in the engine room because you have empty space underneath where all the the pipes, the plumbing, electrical runs, all of that is underneath the deck. Typically. You have it in other places overhead as well, but yeah, you 
usually want to get all that up and out of the way, especially when you're in a shipyard environment, which yeah. is where, where I started. Do you ever have to do any work outside the boat, like in terms of maintenance? Yeah. Um, like the part that's usually submerged underwater, is there some type of maintenance that has to be done over there? Oh, of course. Uh, on smaller boats and stuff like that, you have your, your cutlass bearings, which, you know, support the shaft in the struts where the propeller is and all that. That always has to be kept up. Bearings have to be replaced. You have bearings in the rudder stocks and packing glands that keep the water from coming back into the boat. All that stuff has to be maintained. Uh, this is daily rot routine you're talking about? Here? No, typically you have the you want to have the boat hauled out at least once a year. And sometimes you just get away with an inspection and you say, okay, this looks good. You tighten the packing glands and stuff like that and make sure everything's watertight still. Okay. But um, other boats, like uh, Snowbird was just out of the water, up on the hard, as they call it. They and call up on the hard. Up on the hard. Yeah, that's when you're up on the big stands, like all the boats you saw in... Oh, you mean when they're actually out of the water? Gotcha. You're up on stands. You're supported. That's when you go and you repaint the bottom. Holy hell! How do they lift the whole yacht out of the water? It's gotta be a, it's the, a crane. The travel lift. It's um. It's a big rectangular machine. It has wheels on each side and it has big slings that connect underneath the boat and then it hoists it up. Wow. And that's foolproof. That boat ain't falling off. Well, it can happen, but <laughs> they're very good at it. And, I mean, you've got to figure there's that much money riding on the line. Right. They're, they're pretty careful about and it. Have, and I'm pretty sure they're responsible if something happens on the boat. Oh, of the yeah. boat. Damn, that's crazy. And that's something I'm sure that's provided by the, the port, right? Yeah, where, wherever your shipyard is, that's, that's their main that's service. Yeah. Shipyard, yeah. Port. So yeah. The, the port is where you take the boat in if you're going into, like, a, another country or an island or something? Yes, uh, a port is kind of a general term. It's any place that you bring a boat or a ship into a safe harbor. Uh, and, you know, now we have big commercial ships that dock at the big container ship ports. But anywhere that you have commercial or recreational boat traffic, you, you could consider a port. Gotcha. And what are some of the flags that I see on boats? What do they represent? Sometimes I see country flags. Is that where the boat is originated from, or what do the what do the flags mean? Those are the flags of registry, and when you get to a, a big boat of that size, you can have the boat registered under the flag of a different nation. And what that means is there are certain benefits that apply to each flag state, and the vessel falls under the law jurisdiction of that particular flag. Okay. So you, some, some have more rigorous safety standards and you have to do, you know, yearly or sometimes bi-yearly inspections for safety regulations. There's manning requirements. You have to have a certain amount of people on board, certain amount of people uh, watch standing duties. Uh, hours of rest are very well set out. And then other flag states have almost no oversight where they're like, okay, you paid us this amount of money. Now your flag can be insured by so-and-so. Okay. Your, your, your boat can travel to these ports. But it's better to have some of the better registry states like um, Cayman Islands, which is okay. Snowbird. Uh, Marshall Islands is another one. Snowbird also has a U.S. flag on it. Why? That is the courtesy flag. So when you're in the waters, the territorial waters of any country, and you're not registered as that, as that country's fleet, you have to fly a courtesy flag that lets you know where your home port is. Or, uh, not, sorry, not your home port. Uh, it's just a, it's a sh sign of respect, and that is also a very old nautical custom. Mm. Uh, it's actually used to be considered an act of war like a, it was a it was a malicious act to cruise through the territorial waters of another country without flying a courtesy flag oh, okay wow 
It's like this douchebag is thinks he can come here and not yes. show our flag. Yes. Basically, you know, it's uh, there's a lot of old traditions like that. Um, <clears throat> is there a benefit to going to the Cayman Islands to get your boat registered versus like the U.S. or? or yeah, yeah. Um, there's certain tax benefits or one of the big ones that the owners go for. But when you have a well-documented flag state, it allows you to enter the waters of other countries easier because they they know that there's a certain standard of, you know, lawfulness on board the boat. So you clear ports easier coming into a foreign port like that. They're like, okay, Cayman Island flags, let's see all your documentation, pay for the cruising permit, you're good to go. Okay. You know, some of the other ones, if you were flying under some other less reputable flag, they'd probably come aboard, do an inspection. You know, they want to take a look, make sure you're not pumping out oil and, you know, yeah, waste overboard. So. And I noticed, too, that sometimes you have the name of the of the boat and then it could be uh, like Ball Harbor, or Florida or something. And what does that mean? Is that where the boat was built? No, it's, it's just the home port. It's just something that you designate when you set up the name of a boat along with your flag state you designate a home port so the home port is not going to be the same flag as like the um, the cayman islands for example where you're yeah it, it will flag. be within the flag state okay so wherever you have that main flag is also going to be written on the boat yeah. under underneath the name of the boat okay interesting all right that's cool okay so let me ask you this now um how often do you have to take the boat out? Like when, when, like in your case, Snowbird is a boat that's for sale. How often does a boat that's for sale goes out? Can you go out without the, the owner being present? Like the captain can just be like, hey, we need to stretch the legs a bit. It's been docked too long. Can he just... How, do you, yeah, that's, that's how much free reign does the captain actually have? Well, that's, uh, that's not outside of the realm of possibility, you know, within, uh, you know, being prudent, yes, you do want to exercise the machinery and you don't want it to sit at the dock for too long. Sometimes you can just fire up equipment and have it run while you're still at the dock, but usually you have a, an agenda or a schedule that you're following. So a lot of boats go up to New England and, and further north for the summer. With the owner? Usually the owner flies in and, and meets the boat, but some owners like to travel on board. Okay, so owner's like, I'm going to New England, meet me over there. Yeah. How long does it take, usually? Well, the boats that I've been on are all like 10, 11 knot boats, you know. We, they're displacement holes, so they just cruise along. Uh, that typically takes about four and a half or five days okay. to get all the way up in one shot from Fort Lauderdale to Newport. And the boat doesn't dock at all the whole time? So the captain is... And then I'm assuming a uh, first officer is they're driving the boat. Yeah, Because captain has to rest, I'm assuming, at one point, And then there's no autopilot, right? You take, uh, so you set up a watch schedule, and you'll have at least two people on watch together. And you always, you always ha are supposed to have two people. That's, that's a law. And how much crew is there usually typically on a, on a boat of that size? That's 120 feet. Five, maybe six. No, no cooks. No, they can. You can have chefs on board. Okay. It's uh, it just depends on how much the owner uses the boat, or if the boat's set up in a charter situation. And typically, when you're taking a long passage like that, you'll bring a couple extra people to fill the watch schedule up, and and it helps kind of break up the monotony too, because you have a little bit extra camaraderie and and right. you know, sure. little flavor to the boat. So that is. For me, the best part about the job is getting underway on a long passage like that. It's great. You get into a routine of your watch. You know, you might be on the, the 12 to 4. So it rotates. Like, anybody can do a certain watch. It doesn't necessarily mean, like, these guys are watchers, these guys are not watchers. Yeah, everybody usually takes a, a, a watch standing. And you usually put, like, someone who's less experienced, like, you know, the stewardess, she might know something about the way that the boat runs, but she's not going to be like changing the parameters 
of the, the stabilizers or adjusting the autopilot, but it's someone else to be there with you and help you keep an eye out because you're always supposed to be looking out for other boats, especially at night, someone who's watching the radar and keeping up with all that. Okay. How much of the crew is mechanically inclined to work on the engine if something goes wrong? It depends. The big, the big boats will have usually at least two engineers. On the boats that I've run on, it's usually just one. But you fall under that category too, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes, I was the solo engineer on the last boat, uh, which was uh, same size, 120-foot uh, fed ship. That's the aluminum one that James? That, that's, um, that was uh, Buck Passer. Is that the name of the boat? That was the first boat that I worked on with Jamie. Okay, so Jamie brought you in on Buck Passer. Yeah. I thought that was a, uh, something else you mentioned when you, brought, when you said, I thought that was like some lingo. Yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't know that was the name of the boat. So you had that one and then you went to a different one before Snowbird? Yeah, a couple of different ones. And, and okay, the, the one, Jamie. not all with Jamie, actually. The, the last one I was on was with another captain and that was Lady Victoria. Okay. So, oh, that's the name of the boat. That's the boat, yeah, Lady Victoria. I thought that was, for some reason, I thought the captain was called Lady Victoria. <laughs> How many female captains are there? Does it feel like that? There's more and more female captains out there all the time. I mean, it's, it's obviously, it's a male-dominated industry, yeah, especially in the captain's way. position. Yeah, but there are more and more women coming up and, you know, making it known that, yeah, we can do this too. I don't see why not. I mean, there's, yeah. I mean, they, they can pretty much do everything we can. <laughs> so I don't see the problem. <laughs> Unless you have to lift 100,000 pounds where you need more than one person. But other than that, I feel like jobs are equality, so you can do whatever you want. Like, yeah. All right, interesting. So um, curious thing for me now is when you are on these voyages, what, what's, what's daily life like for, for you guys? Like, I'm assuming you're, you have to constantly be doing something but I would also assume that you can catch up on things and you're kind of like chilling on the boat. Yeah. Or does that not really happen? Are you always rubbing something or well, polishing something? On passages, uh, a typical schedule is a four-hour watch, and then you'll have the next eight hours off. And you need to rest up and be ready for your next watch in eight hours. But I definitely go around to take a look through the engine room, if I have something small to do, I'll do that. But I also spend a lot of time out on deck. I bring my camera out, take pictures of the, the seascape, you know, interesting birds that live out at sea, follow the boat. So, interesting. yeah, it's, it's, um, it's nice to be able to just enjoy the passage. You know, even if you just spend an hour out on deck, take a nap in the, in the sun or something, mm. it's nice. I always like the nighttime when I'm on a boat. Something about no light pollution. Yeah. Although it's scary as hell because there's just empty blackness. But when you look up, it's, it's uh, pretty amazing to see how much we're robbed of the sky when we're in the main city. Yeah. It's amazing that for all of human existence, they had this connection to the night sky. And, you know, thousands of years of storytelling and tradition and now you you only see a couple bright stars even in the suburban environment. And if they're stars, they could be satellites. Yeah, exactly. You see more of those than stars in a lot of places. Yeah, you've um, you ever been on the um, west side, the, like Aurea Borealis? You ever seen the? No, I I haven't been uh, far enough north or south in latitude to see the aurora, but. We did have some pretty fantastic cruising on another job that I did with Jamie. We came from San Diego down through the Panama Canal and then back up here to Fort Lauderdale. And that was 17 days total underway. And we had 11 days from San Diego to Panama. And that was just amazing at night, especially down off of Central America. 17 days straight. Yeah, we stay. We were in Panama for one night. Okay, I'm assuming you're refueling when when you're staying there. So how how long can the fuel last you, generally speaking? On that boat, we had uh, almost 11,000 gallons fuel capacity, and that was good for about 3,000 miles. 3,000. 
nautical miles? What's the difference between a nautical mile and a regular mile? <laughs> a regular statute mile is 5,280 feet, and a nautical mile is 6,076 feet. So it's a little, it's, it's a, a little bit more. just a little bit longer. Wow. And that's because the nautical miles derived from the mathematical model of how the latitude and longitude is laid out on the Earth. Interesting. Super interesting. Um, so on, on these voyages, on these long voyages, um, you see anything crazy out there? Yeah. Um, like, I'm assuming there's, like, shit has to be going down, like, out there. Like, you could be, I mean, granted, like, <clears throat> with modern technology, I feel like you can kind of, like, map out very well so you know what the weather's going to be like ahead of time. But I assume, like, unpredictable shit happens all the time. So what's, on, on any voyage that you've done since you've started, what's the craziest situation that you were like holy shit we could be we could be done for or have you not been in that situation yet we've had a couple close calls um on that trip coming down from san diego to panama we had all new electronics installed and they they weren't installed right basically and the autopilot was not communicating with the GPS plotter. Oh, so there is autopilot. I, I assume there was no... <laughs> I don't know why I assumed there was no autopilot. I feel like you'd never leave something like that up to chance when there's... Could be anything. Could be a rogue wave. Could be a whale just stumbles across you and it's like... Yeah. Uh, well, that is a big risk, and that's part of the, the situation that, that I'm describing is that the autopilot was being controlled by the GPS, and... The GPS kept losing its signal, and it would turn the boat like 45 degrees. Like all of a sudden, the boat would just turn, deviate from course. And in a couple different situations, it started going towards land, and it was going to take the boat. Uh, it was going to navigate us through the isthmus of Mexico to the Caribbean Sea. And I was like, well, you would think this machine knows that you can't navigate a boat through land, but it was going to try. <laughs> it's probably Apple Maps. So we actually had to disconnect them from each other and uh, use the autopilot solely on its own, which is a much safer way to do it anyway. Okay. And that's how most of the boats that I've been on, at least, are set up. All the autopilot commands are input manually. The, the plotter has no control over it. Gotcha. Okay, interesting. And how far are you from, from shore when, when you're doing a passage like that? I, I always assume you guys are far out at sea. You guys are not that far out? 200 or 500 miles offshore, you know, depending on the coastline, because you're trying to take the straightest path possible. Right. And sometimes you have to alter your course slightly due to shipping lanes. Uh, shipping lanes, you're talking about yeah, you know, there's there's shipping lanes that are set up that bring the big commercial traffic in and out of the major ports. Okay. So you're supposed to cross those shipping lanes at nearly 90 degrees so you don't loiter and spend any time in that traffic zone. Hmm. How is that monitored? Is it monitored, like, through drones? or? Uh, well, there's a system called AIS, uh, Automatic Identification System, I think it, it stands for, M. That is like a radio signal that's broadcast from all the ships that have that transponder. And it shows you a pinpoint on your plotter and your radar where those big ships are. Okay. And sometimes it can be turned off, which is a terrible idea. And it's very accessible. Even small boats can put an AIS transponder on and broadcast their position to all the boats in a, you know, seven... 12 mile radius oh, interesting. yes it's a great great safety feature but you we know we have radars too we always have two radars operating uh and as well as your visual you know just look out someone's yeah. got to be looking out the windows all yeah. the time in theory at least um, what's the furthest you've ever traveled was it that trip yeah that's my longest passage okay. that was Europe or anything like that. i haven't been across uh the atlantic yet i how far in the Caribbean have you been? Um, all the boats that I've done are pretty much east coast. So but it's been like Bahamas and up to New England. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of been my like niche in the last six years. Okay. 
All right, and, and I'm assuming the same thing for Jamie as well, right? Yeah, um, I've worked on these American flag boats. Jamie's, Jamie's been obviously in the industry a lot longer, and he was on some boats back in the day that did a lot of traveling. He's been everywhere, through Alaska, through the Caribbean, yeah. So he definitely put the miles. Yeah, he's got a lot of stories. Okay, so um, where do you see your, yourself in, in this career? How, you, you plan on being in it much longer? You plan on getting your own lobster boat and doing your own thing or? <laughs> I do miss uh, the autonomy of the lobster boat side of it, but I'll actually be probably testing for my 200 ton captain's license I probably take the test next summer and then I need to build up a little more sea time before they'll actually give me the license to be a t captain. Yeah, it's for a 200 ton license. So the captain's license go in steps depending on your experience and the tonnage of the vessels that you've been on board. So give me some examples in layman's terms. Uh, a 200 ton is how much is what size boat? Is it the one the like Snowbird? A little smaller. Snowbird. I I think Snowbird is 296 tons or something okay. but it's a very you know voluminous boat so it has a higher tonnage okay. something like buck passer was only eight feet shorter but it was narrower and it didn't have as many you know levels to it i think buck passer was 230 236 something like that okay. so that would put me in that range of uh something that's 80, 90 to 110, you know, depending on the build of the boat. Gotcha. So once you get this license, um, how many different tonnage license, how many times can you go up? Is it 500, 600? It goes up. Uh, so you have like 100, 200, 500. From 500, it jumps to 1,600. Those, I'm assuming, are containers. Container, uh, container boats? Those are unlimited. That's an unlimited class license, which is like when you've been on huge commercial ships offshore and you put all the time and there's a lot of training that goes with it too. You have to do certification courses that allow you to basically tick boxes off in your experience and those allow you to move your license up to that level. What's some of the things that you have to train for uh, that you get tested on to become a captain of a 200-ton vessel? 200-ton, there's going to be some stability questions about the Question way. Time. Yeah, yeah, you, you test for everything. So it's not like anything practical. It's all based off, like, books. Yeah, there's no, like, you drive a boat around and show <laughs> anybody. That's what I told my a friend of mine is, <laughs> is taking his captain's course right now, and I was like, it has almost nothing to do with running a boat. It's all about regulations, uh, okay. safety protocols, the, the lawful operation of the vessel. You do have sections on navigation, especially a uh, big part of the, le the test that people struggle with initially is the, the lights. So at night, all you can see is a red or a green, white, yellow. And you have to look at this little cluster of lights on the horizon and be able to tell which direction that vessel's heading, the front if, the yeah, if they're towing, how long the tow is, the size of the ship, it, it all is coded in the way the lights are laid out. So what do the lights represent? Can you break it down for me? Yeah. Like what the lights colors mean? I mean, the basic ones are, so you have your port side is a red light, and that shows from this side all the way up forward. Okay. Uh, I think it's 12. 12 and a half degrees abaft of the beam, which means like a little behind. So if you're coming up from behind a boat, all you'll see is his white light, his stern light. If you're coming from any other angle from the side or from the forward, the red you'll see the red, or if you're on his starboard side, you'll see the green light. Okay. So that gives you the directionality. And then there's other ones, there's you know yellow lights for your, um, your towing and stuff like that. And Different configurations of those tell you how long the tow is, mm -hmm. and if the tow is of a certain Wait, size. Like coat or something? No, they stay on all the time. Okay, so how can you tell what size tow you have? So, there'll be like two or three in sequence. 
for a long tow. And then if you have a big object that's being towed, like a barge, it'll have its own set of lights on it. Gotcha. It'll have the directional port and starboard, red and green, and it'll also have a stern light on it okay. to mark the size of the tow because people you know cut it short. Wondered, like, why is it called starboard? Uh, I, there, there is a story behind that. I, I couldn't be able to tell you off the top <laughs> of my head, but all these words go back. And I, I think actually there's a story about the British Navy changed port. It used to be like Learboard or something. It was a different word, but it was confusing. So they just made it as different as possible. Port is short and simple, and starboard is like the old traditional word. Interesting. It you'd make it. It would. It would make it seem like that's where you'd see the stars for some reason. <laughs> it's called starboard, but the sky is like all around you. So uh, that just doesn't make sense. Why they just say that's the right side of the boat? Yeah. That's the left side of the boat. When I mean, when you're talking about like. Uh, you know, lingo yeah. and being able to communicate with people on a film yeah. set. It's the it's same the way same on thing, a boat. Yeah. You have I think they all have their own little uh, words for things. Like that's not called something that's called this Very instead. Specific. Yeah, that's super interesting. Okay, so um, for example, the captain that's on the Snowbird, for example, what license does he have? A 300 ton? Uh, sorry, 500 ton? Jamie's is a 3,000, 3,000 ton. So all oceans. Jamie, Jamie was was the captain on the boat that we were on. Yeah. But the uh, oh, I didn't realize that was his name. Um, the person that was upstairs that we interviewed, um, I thought was the captain. Yeah. yeah that's his name, Jamie. Yeah. So the other gentleman that's from Bahamas, what's his name? That's Josh. Josh. Oh, I I mistook Jamie for Josh. Yeah. Okay. I mistook Jamie for Josh. That's why I thought you were talking about the whole time. I thought you were talking about Josh. Okay, so Jamie, the gentleman that's upstairs, you know, I'll tell you this. When I walked into the, what's it called, the the room with all the the room where you drive the boat, uh, the cockpit, the bridge. the bridge. How impressive is that room? It's fantastic. I it mean, is, there's a lot of technology lot packed of in shit there. Happening in there, but man, does it look like it looks like I went into the future when I walked in there. It didn't look like anything I expected. Like compared to what I came, I mean, granted, my, my grandfather's boat was a a Chris Craft. Okay. I think about 40 feet. Cool. Think think it was from the 80s, bro. Like we had the like none of that, none of the shit that's on yours with the look like you had like a 3D view of your boat and the radar and everything. Man, that looks intense. My my grandfather used to drive his boat with a compass and his RPMs. So he knew he was traveling a certain speed based on his engine RPMs, and he could time that direction or his heading and his speed, and that would give him the time that he was going to arrive at his trap lines. Okay. And, right. and the stars, too, you know. Yeah. It's easy when you're out there to kind of get a reference star. Yeah, you start to familiarize yourself with, with, the, with the stars and what, where they are and what, point, what part of the year you're in, too. Like super interesting, oh, yeah. Yeah, like you could you could take away the calendar from somebody. They'd be like, oh yeah, we're this is around July. <laughs> it's pretty interesting, like the way they they map the the sky to be able to tell you like, well I don't know if the zodiac's system is what helps people determine that, but I'm assuming back then they didn't even have like Cancer, Libra, or any of these things. But back then when they were charting maps, I think they were just going based off like patterns and. I can't imagine the person that sat there every single day looking at the sky, seeing if it changed at all throughout the year, and then be like, oh, this star is not here today. It's there today. Well, that's just going back to that connection yeah. that all they all had. Right. Yeah. They looked at it every night. Yeah. And, uh, and they were actually very mathematically precise back then. Yeah. Like the origins of our modern zodiac, they go all the way back. They actually predate the Greeks and go all the way back to like uh, Persian and uh, Sumerian culture, mm. which some of the first to really lay down the basic stars that we use in our, our modern zodiac and gotcha. the mythologies associated with them. And mm. of course, now we're, we are super precise about it. And that's actually a, a test I'll be taking probably next summer too, is my uh, celestial navigation test. What does that look like? 
do they have you go out in the middle of the night? It's like <laughs> no, actually, they don't. They don't think they make you take any shots. It's their problems basically. So they'll tell you, you took this reading at this time and this date. So you have to look up all the corresponding information in the book, and what you're doing is you're measuring the angle from a star to the horizon. But okay. what you really want is the distance of the star to the zenith. That's the point directly overhead. So you're subtracting. So like right above you. Yes. About the zenith? Yes. Interesting. So you measure the angle to the horizon, and then you get that subtraction. You get that value. Then you have to apply a series of corrections for um, atmospheric refraction, uh, the, the date, uh, there's, there's a whole series that you go through, and that gives you a line of position that you plot on a map. And then okay. you, you typically want two or three lines of position to give you an estimate of where you are at sea. Okay. So does the captain, does the, is the captain hired by the owner or by the, the shipyard? It, it'll be through the owner, typically, okay. but there are, there are management companies that you know place captains in different roles okay. depending on on what they need so it, when you get your your captain license do you have to join this type do you need to find like an agent or management or something that helps you get jobs as captains on boats it's helpful but not necessarily okay again it's probably networking so jamie will probably hook you up with your first boat be like hey you looking at captain yeah it's like hey i got a great spot for you over here you'll like this okay. so how long is the captain's job for on the boat like do you have a, i'm assuming they don't have a regular work schedule like how does it i mean sometimes you'll you'll sign a contract and that can be a year two years five years it it just depends on the the nature of the boat the role that they want that boat to to you know to play in in their lives as the owner do they want to use it a couple times a year do they want to go on a round the world trip you got to have a very good relationship with your captain if you want to work that hard on a boat you have to build up a lot of good spares on board you have to have a good team okay and and, and if you're doing this globe trotting adventure with with someone's boat do you have to do extra training to know like the other countries like laws or something like or is the captain license universal it, it is in some ways. I mean, there's different regulatory agencies for, for pretty much all countries for their maritime programs. Uh, the big ones that kind of most people fall under are the United States, which is the Merchant Mariner Credential. That's, that's a universally accepted one. STCW, which is the kind of uh, international regulations from the international maritime organization they okay. they have a licensing schedule that's well recognized there's the uh m mya i think that's the british certification okay. so yeah every every major maritime country has their own sort of certificates and same thing with the flag states some are accepted more widely than others okay. but it it really all boils down to uh you know, professionalism. Like, look at that guy on the Costa Concordia cruise ship. He was, he was licensed for all kinds of stuff. He was probably pretty well respected for yeah. some avenues, but he made a big so mistake. How do you think it is um, <coughs> captaining a boat like a cruise ship versus a yacht? Is it? Oh, it's way different. Yeah, it's like it's like. Is it as, as different as a semi truck to a car? Yeah, yeah, even more so because it's so much more stratification and organization. I mean, at at that level, the captain doesn't really drive the boat. He's he's the head manager. He's signing off all the papers. There's a ton of regulatory just accoutrement that that just falls with that. So okay. at that level, it's mostly a desk job. Wow. Okay, and but with you guys, the captain is the one piloting the the vessel. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but you always kind of uh, should be training the other people on the boat to be able to handle the boat. Like I, I've driven all these boats with Jamie offshore in the channels. Usually, the captain brings it on and off the dock because that's where he's really 
paid <laughs> to be on the wheel. Uh, and most of the time these days, it's a joystick. Wow. It's like a PlayStation controller, like Ocean Gate. Oh my God, you saw that shit? You saw you saw that Ocean Gate thing with the the um, the people that went in the submersible. Oh, you yes. had to have heard about that. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, this this guy had a PlayStation Two controller as the thing to guide the vessel. Yeah, you know I saw a whole video on on why that the Ocean Gate um, imploded, okay. and it was because of its hull was made out of carbon fiber. Carbon fiber yeah. 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 Typically they use they titanium. Yeah. They tried to save some weight with carbon fiber, although carbon fiber is super strong, but not at those depths. Yeah, and ca carbon fiber, you know, it has, it's a composite material. It's, it has laminations between it. When you start yeah. to separate, yeah. it's, it's, like it's weakens. Little, yeah, it's very intricate little things, yeah. I can't imagine why these billionaires would have built something like this. You would not seek professional advice from people, be like, hey, how do I properly do this and not kill like five people i mean a lot of these guys were billionaires in the yeah. boat that's crazy that that's that's how you die like you make this fortune and that's how you go out it's pretty crazy all to see the titanic i mean i want to see the titanic i'm a big fan of that of the whole lore of the titanic ever since i saw it when i was a kid when i first saw the movie i was always fascinated with how it you know, all, I saw all the documentaries on Titanic, even one that I saw a few years back where um, someone uncovered some documents that was saying how almost like the Titanic was doomed to sink because it was technically on fire, technically on fire before it even left the port because the first thing they put on the boat was the coal room. Yeah. And the first thing they put in there were coal. And something I didn't know was if coal sits there, it can spontaneously combust. Yeah, yeah. So apparently it had already combusted into flame when they sent it out. So when it when the hull or the starboard, I think it was the starboard side that hit the, the iceberg, it already had a weakened hull from the fire that was already in there. And that's why it wasn't able to sustain the, the impact. Because so many times they're like, well, there, it shouldn't have, the, the um, iceberg shouldn't have sunk it. Like it didn't hit it hard enough where it should have like broken it the way it did it they had to have more damage so this thing came out many many years later again I, i'm not really sure if it's a conspiracy theory or not but it was super interesting um event that happened in the early 1900s like and it was uh, like the ship was in amazingly beautiful at the time yeah, so it was incredible. just to be on that boat must have been amazing yeah because back then there wasn't i think it was the the first major like cruise ship to go from London to New York. It, it was kind of a big competition back then. They were always like trying to outdo each other because exactly. there was just several big steamship lines. So that was one of the things that it was actually trying to do. It was, and they said that in the movie, like, wouldn't it be great if we got there like, yes, like the day before they were yeah, supposed to get they, there? They were so they, to save yeah, hours. yeah, and they were trying to save Titanic from bankruptcy. Like, it was their last chance. Titanic had to make it, and ironically, it still sunk, and, and the company would have tanked regardless, you know, because if the ship was really on fire, when it would it would have gone to port, and it would have literally been ablaze by the time it got there. So, so who knows how it would have went down. If the iceberg didn't take it, maybe the fire would have. I, you know what? Here's the thing on conspiracies. Tell me the story of the Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> I know this is a big... When I was a, I have to say this. I have, a, I have this thing with conspiracy theories. I love them. They're, they're very fun to, to just kind of like lose yourself in it a little bit and try to, try to like speculate what, what's happening. Is it aliens? Is it electromagnetic field? Is all these things? And, and I watch a lot of those conspiracy documentaries with one of my best friends, Steve, and watch a lot of aliens, watch a lot of uh, uh, unsolved mysteries, yeah. you know, and what. And always one of the ones that was always weird was the Bermuda Triangle. And it was always weird for us because, especially for me, is when you're flying out of Haiti, you fly right above the damn thing. Yeah, and, uh, you know how many planes fly over it? And, and for some reason, this brief period of time, I think it was during World War II or after World War II, there was a lot of ships and planes that were going down and nothing was coming up. 
no buoys, no life preservers. Whatever went down, always went down. So, what is the, <laughs> what is the the, uh, I don't know what the proper word is, but what is the thing with 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 you guys when you guys are talking about the Bermuda Triangle? You guys don't believe that stuff. It's it's just like folklore. It's just stories. It's like a Ouija board. I've definitely never considered it on any of our trips. Like. No one told you some crazy story one day. It's like, yo, dude, one day we had some crazy readings out there and couldn't explain what was going on or. Never seen anything an anomalous, I should say. <laughs> but, you know, it can be a very treacherous area. Like if you're going, if you're transiting the Gulf Stream and you have any northerly component to the wind, it stands up. The sea gets tall and, and short, steep waves. It's very dangerous, even in a big boat. You can, you can get hung up. You start taking big waves, what they call a green sea, where a wave comes up over the deck and okay. washes down That's the decks. A green, a green sea, yeah. Oh, interesting. So you could start getting those tall, steep waves, and they start hitting the boat. And if the water doesn't get off the deck fast enough, you lose stability. Right. Yeah, and then the boat can go down. But what was always interesting with the whole Bermuda Triangle thing is is what went down never came back up. Like in terms of like they things that would float, yet. like nothing would float up. Bodies, like life preservers, things that are meant to go up don't go up. And it was super interesting to, you know, dive into those conspiracies. You know. That is why they label all of the elements that belong on the boat, the life vest, the lifeboats the life rings, and really, they call that appurtenances. And anything that is an appurtenance of the vessel is, the vessel is like a legal entity, and it is considered property of the vessel. Gotcha. Like, almost like it was an individual. Right, gotcha. Okay, interesting. Yeah, so let me ask you this. Uh, you personally, do you, wa you watch a lot of movies? like a lot of boating movies? Like, is there a specific one that you like that kind of does the job justice? Uh, not really. I don't, I don't watch movies very often. What do you do on your free time when, when you're not, when you're not tending to your boat? Uh, your free time consists of? I is pick up trash. <laughs> yeah, I pick up trash on the beach. Oh, yeah, and, 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 and drink Modelo. You know what? Tell me about your little, your little trash picking adventures. Yeah. Like that's, I found that very fascinating that that is something that you just do on your free time. So tell me about how it started. When did you start doing that? It actually started the same time that I moved back to the Keys in uh, about 2009. So, you know, when we, were, when we were kids, we used to go to the beach and go snorkeling and diving and stuff mm -hmm. in, in Key West. And I, I guess my parents kind of instilled that in us because if there was somebody that left their beer cans or something on the beach – my parents would go over and pick them up and throw them away. Sure. Just keep it nice, you know? Yeah. So I guess maybe that set in for us. And when I moved back to the Keys, you get uh, it's just an absurd amount of plastic that comes from the Gulf Stream, and the wind and the currents bring it all, and it catches in the Keys, mm -hmm. either on the beaches. There's not many beaches in, in the lower Keys, but... Uh, the beaches and the mangroves trap all of this. Sure, yeah. I can understand with the mangroves. It just gets tangled in there. Of course, yeah. And it, ne and it ne almost never leaves. Yeah, no, there's no way for it to leave. So, you know, I was in my spare time off of the boat. I'm exploring or I'm at the beach. And I'm like, look at how bad this is. Like, it, it was just ridiculous. And I just couldn't walk past it anymore. And I became so interested in it that I would bring everything I picked up back home with me and I'd shake it all out on a tarp and I was sorting it and analyzing it, trying to understand more about it myself. Okay, because so this is trash that's already washed up on shore or are, you, or are you talking about going into the water? No, this is the stuff that's come ashore. Okay. Because, you know, so, so much of it, the majority of it comes from the rest of the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. So you're picking bottles from... Mexico, Bahamas, yeah. Dominican Republic, Haiti. Yeah, Haiti. Uh, like those, plas those plastic Juma bottles, Jumex. Jumex, yeah. <laughs> like the, um, so much of it comes from Haiti, too, which is really sad because I, I know they don't have 
the infrastructure in place to handle I mean, it's bad over there. Yeah. Like when I was living over there, like there was so much trash inside the sewage system and where the canals of the water used to evacuate. Whenever it would rain, that's why there was a lot of mudslides. That's why every time it rained in Haiti, if it rained for more than two hours, sometimes it wouldn't even rain in the city. If it rained in the mountains, that water is coming down at such speed and velocity. It's taking everything with it and the amount of trash that it would just, I don't know where it would end up, but it would just end up probably in the ocean somewhere, probably because there's not a lot of flat land. It's a lot of incline. So I'm just imagining it just all going down all the way till it gets down to the beach. And yeah, there is absolutely no infrastructure to contaminate or even control that at all. Yeah. And, it, and it's, and not only do you not have the infrastructure, the Haitian people are robbed of an education. They don't know what to do with the trash. They're not, there's, because of there's no infrastructure, they just throw away where they think they should drop it. Yeah. Sometimes it's just over a wall. Sometimes it's over a small bridge into what used to be a river, but it's now dried up, you know, which becomes a river when it starts to rain. It just washes up all the trash, you know, and, or they would burn it. You know, that's something that's super common too. It's, they would burn it. Um, but yeah, that's, that doesn't surprise me at all that you get trash from all the Caribbean. I mean, how big is that trash island off the Pacific? Well, they, <laughs> yeah, the area itself of the, of the gyre is enormous. And yeah, that's the, so each ocean basin has a set of gyres. So you have the North Pacific gyre and then in the South Pacific, you have a gyre in the middle of the basin as well. And there's also a North Atlantic. But what's a gyre? What, what is it? So ocean currents maintain um, basically a, a rotation. And in the North Atlantic, it's clockwise. So you think about the Gulf Stream is coming up and then it turns off of the Carolinas and it meanders across over towards England and, and the UK. And then the currents on that side, they meander south, but they don't cross the equator. So in that Atlantic Ocean Basin, you have this kind of clockwise circulation around oh, the entire ocean. It's kind of like a, gives it like a whirlpool effect. So all the stuff gets into a center. Things get brought in and that's kind of like um, the Sargasso Sea that's out there south of Bermuda, Bermuda and p part of the Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> it's, uh, it's an area where the ocean currents converge and uh, that's the main habitat of the sargassum that everyone's been talking about. Interesting. But you have these things that accumulate there and actually that was a major, a major kind of proof of concept for Christopher Columbus mm -hmm. because he had traveled to the Azores and the people that lived in, in the islands there, they showed him these like wood carvings and like human artifacts that they said came from across the ocean to the west. So he's like, I know there's people there and I know there's land there. That's crazy, man. Back then to think about like they, when they, they literally assumed, I mean, it's something that I'm guilty of. I'm sure a lot of kids were at the time. I remember when my grandfather used to take us to the beach, uh, I used to look at the horizon and I literally, I remember this question so much. I looked at my grandmother, I was like, do we fall off if we <laughs> get to the end? <laughs> Just, <laughs> so crazy. But back then to think about the person that's like, I don't know, let's go find out. And then they'd be gone in months, years. Yeah, they like they don't even know if they're going to come back. How crazy is that mentality? Like I can't imagine going to, and then convincing a crew. To go with you. Oh, yeah, they were going to murder him and throw him <laughs> overboard because they wanted to all turn back. I mean, I'm sure after like six months, they're like, yo, bro, I think you're out of your mind. I don't think there's, I think we might just like, either this thing's going to go on forever because yeah. they don't know the world's round. That's so they didn't know how long they were going to be man, at sea. Man. Run out of run out of food and water and that's it. That's probably, I feel like the scariest thing is running out of food because how much provisions do you carry with you? On a trip like that, well, those <laughs> boats are very well stocked. On on those, you know those, uh, they call that a a nao, a nail. It's a Portuguese water. Those are like open boats, basically. Like they had a little stern castle area in the back, but 
if you see the recreations of them, they look like big wooden canoes. Like, they yeah. weren't very big ships. Yeah, probably no rooms or anything like that. Yeah, they all slept down below the decks, man, or in a hammock on someplace out of the way. Yeah, wow. The life of a seaman, right? That was tough times back then. <laughs> Can you imagine? It's, con it's yeah. considerably improved. <laughs> Especially for people on yachts. Okay, so your your hobby of picking up uh, the plastic. What, what do you do after you pick these things up? What, what so you keep, you've been doing this for like 13 years now. So, yeah, so what what have you done with the trash once you get them? Do you recycle them? Uh, very little of it is recyclable, actually. If you find some like um, polyethylene water bottles that are still in pretty good shape. Those are recyclable. Aluminum cans, you know, they're always washed up on the beach from sandbars and stuff. I would usually take those out and recycle them. But most of the plastic either is non-recyclable from the start, like especially bottle caps. Mm -hmm. Most colored plastic is very hard to recycle, and they don't even bother with it. Gotcha. Um, and then things that have been so degraded by the UV that, that they are just crumble when you touch them. You you would never be able to recycle that either. Okay. What's, what's the most interesting thing you found in terms of value? All trash, or did you stumble on a Rolex somewhere? No, I've never found anything really <laughs> valuable. But to me, uh, you know, there's other, like, benefits, like just being in nature on the beach. Yeah. I, I've I just I mean, always loved that. Tan, you look like you like to be yeah, I'm in the sun all the time. Yeah, I love it. Um, I love collecting driftwood and uh have you know made projects out of driftwood and stuff like that i love everyone loves finding sea beans you know the little sea beans so there's a big brown one it's a reddish brown that's called a sea heart and it comes from a, a giant vine and has these big seed pods and sea hearts are really cool uh, but what are they they're, are they they're not a rock it's a bean like it's an edible bean no it's not edible although some varieties are used in the uh, ayahuasca okay. that they do in the rainforest. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Okay. There's have little you, ones have that. You ever done no. No. What's that would be. That would be pretty fun, though. I want to do it. I'm not gonna lie. I've, I've, I, when I visited Peru a few years ago, I really wanted to do it, but I couldn't afford the sick day that might come after, okay, yeah. because we were such on a tight schedule. Yeah. But it's something I've always wanted to do. You know, um, I've just heard so many interesting things about it, and I always wanted to see what it's all about. I heard the trip only lasts about 15 minutes. What comes after is what most people don't like is uh, there's a lot of throwing up because it's a detox. So not only are you detoxing all the toxins in your body while you're regurgitating everything you just did the past who knows how long, yeah. but you're also like it's a mental detox. Some people claim they see God. Some people claim they see what they're meant to do in life. I met a very interesting person. I'm actually trying to get him to come on the podcast. I met him at a farmer's market. His name is Mr. Mushroom. Yeah. All right. But he's not Mr. Mushroom. He told me Mr. Mushroom told him to open a mushroom stand. Awesome. And it was on one of these trips because he had no idea what he was doing with his life. He literally did one of these trips. I don't know if it was a mushroom or if it was ayahuasca. And he's like, Mr. Mushroom came to him and said, you need to open a mushroom shop. You need to study mushroom. This is your thing. He literally did that. He said when he woke up the next day, he maxed out his cards and bought everything he needed to start farming mushrooms. And that's what he does. Free, freaking amazing. And I'm trying to get him to come on uh, to see if I can get him to come tell me my tell, tell me this story yeah, just fun. more. Yeah, just yeah. super, super fun. Um, but, yeah, man, it, it, this was a very fun conversation, man. I really, really appreciate you coming down. I know it was hell of a drive to come down here. Yeah, but that's South Florida. Yeah, it's just, man, South Florida is, is on another level when it comes to the traffic. Yeah. Like every highway is jam-packed around rush hour. So it's, I really appreciate you coming down and doing the effort and bringing the Modellos, of course. Of course. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Sonny. Um, and uh, maybe I'll have you come back on after you get your captain's license and see what that's like. Yeah. See how long, well, what, is Sonny short for something or is that really your name? Short for Edison. Edison. Edison Parker. Yeah. Okay, that's what it says on your license. <laughs> Parker Jr. So Sonny is, uh, okay, so you're a junior. So yeah, I've been called Ed uh, Sonny since I was a little baby. My, my okay. grandparents thought Edison was too formal. I've, I've literally been called that since I was born. Awesome, awesome.
Well, thank you so much for coming on, man. I really appreciate yeah, it. Thanks for having me, man. All right. Fun. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to the Oliver Stone Podcast, Safe Journeys Across the Stars.